Well, here we are in Aladdin's cave. Now, the name or the title I've given to this message has to do with Aladdin and the magic lamp and uh, Aladdin's cave and all of the uh, possibilities that exist. If you could just rub that genie lamp and out comes our little genie friend and gives you anything that you your heart desires. So the title of this message is Imagine the Possibilities and that's why we're sitting in Aladdin's cave. Do you know what it cost me to build this place? Unbelievable. But imagine the possibilities if we could just make a wish, rub the lamp, make a wish and make it come true. Now let me ask you this, what would your one, say if you were granted one wish, what would it be? Think about that for just a second. What's the most important thing right now in your life? Is it health? Is it finances? Is it a relationship that you're working on and trying to accomplish something in it? It has to be uh, it has to be something really, really, really important that you could actually believe for just a moment that you could rub the magic genie lamp, Aladdin comes out of that lamp and just says, Master, here you go. Your wish is my command. It's done. What would it be? Think about it. I've thought about that a lot. Um, I've been pretty fortunate in my life one, I actually have good health, <clears throat> so I don't need that. I've had tons of money, as you probably know. So I really didn't need that then, and I don't really need that now, because the good Lord has taken care of my daily bread needs. Uh, relationships, there are some relationships that bear, they always seem to bear uh, a need in one uh, way or another. It could be uh, between parents and children. Um, as in my case, I certainly would like to have my children around me a lot more than they are. So, what is your absolute one desire of your heart to get accomplished right now? You say, well, John, you know what? I'm not that, I'm not that lucky. Believe me, no good things happen to me. I, uh, it's just not that way. Um, let me tell you about some other people that have talked to me. They said about coincidence. You know, it wasn't really luck. I guess maybe you could call it luck, but I was in a convenience store. And I found a dollar bill sitting on the floor. Now I picked up the dollar bill and I said to myself, Self, what can I buy with that? Can't buy a candy bar. It's a dollar six with a tax in Massachusetts. I can't buy a soda, that's more than a dollar, because a five cent deposit on a can. What can I buy with a dollar? And then, off they go to the ticket counter and say, give me one lottery ticket, please. Lo and behold, they go home and they hit the lottery for $5,000. Was that luck? Sure. I guess you could call it that. Was that a coincidence? Well, they were in the store at that very second that the dollar was on the floor. Maybe the guy that was in line before them just dropped it. Is it a coincidence? Don't know. Well, let me tell you about a Bible verse that actually eliminates the uh, possibility of good luck and eliminates the possibility of any coincidence happening. And it's called Romans 8.28. And the Lord God himself said this, um, All good things happen to those who are called according to his purpose um, and who love the Lord. So, two requirements for good things to happen to you, without the genie Aladdin here. Good things <clears throat> happen to those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. So you have to have a relationship going because if you love somebody, you have a relationship going with them, right? You have to have. You can't just visit that person once a week, like going to church, and say, okay, there I am. I'm in a deep relationship with God because I go to church once a week. doesn't work that way. Relationships are daily, all day long. You, you, 
if you're in love with somebody, um, then I know this much, because um, I've actually gone through it, is that you want to be with that person consistently, all day long. That's who you think about, you call them, hey, how you doing? Not to the point where you're haunting them, but that's what love does. You can't wait to hold their hand, whatever it is. That's called a true relationship. Well, a, a deep abiding relationship with God is absolutely no different uh, in that you want to be with God throughout the day. You want to talk with Him, which some people refer to it as prayer, but you're really talking with God one-to-one -one, like you have a relationship. And who comes to my mind right now is Moses that had such a good relationship with God. He was actually called, as was David the king, a friend of God. Imagine being a friend of God. Imagine God being right next to you, right by your side, as your friend. Well, that's exactly what he's telling us in Romans 8, 28. Good things happen to those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. That means you have a plan and purpose that you've allowed God to say, Okay, Lord, I want to know what your plan and purpose is for my life. I don't know if you've done that yet, but if you haven't, maybe you should. And maybe you should get to click on that link below. I'm always telling you that because that's my job. Click on the link below so you can get to know who this Jesus is, why you need a Savior, what that's going to prevent you from going into, which is that lake of fire, and a whole host of other things, and how easy it is to actually receive the gift of salvation. And after that, all good things happen to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Let me keep going. What prompted this message was, I was in church, my church, last Sunday, and the preacher was preaching out of Luke 18, 35-41 about a blind man. Well, he was preaching in one direction that the blind man should have been thankful because Thanksgiving week has been, you know, last Thursday. And uh, so his whole message was on returning the thanks for, to God for what he does for you. But while he was preaching that message, I was hearing this message, which is imagine the possibilities. And I was thinking to myself, sitting in the church, listening quite intently and taking a page full of notes, Every time I would get a thought, I would write that note down, and you are getting it right now. So it's amazing how God works things out. But I was thinking, imagine being blind for all or most of your life, and all of a sudden, possibilities of seeing come to your mind. That's exactly what happened in this story of Luke chapter 18. And here is the story that Jesus came into this village, uh, Jericho, and there was a blind man um, a few, sort of like, a, let's say a block away, sitting on the street side where the crowds were gathering, lines of people, and this guy's taking advantage of that. He had his friends, because he couldn't see, sit him down in the most uh, desirous place where people would be walking by, and they'd have to give him money because he'd be begging for money. That's how he earned is living. So the blind beggar heard now that Jesus was drawing near and he cried out to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Now think about what he said. And he's yelling it because Jesus was a block or two away. He didn't know. He couldn't see. All he could do was hear the commotion and the excitement that Jesus was nearby. Jesus, son of David. Now, why would he say son of David? David lived a couple of thousand years before this. 1800 years, I think. So, why would he cry out son of David? Because he knew that the Messiah was coming through the line of King David. And he acknowledged by shouting that out, Jesus, I believe that you are the one that the Old Testament prophets have talked about. You are the Messiah. Have mercy upon me. And he was imagining the possibilities, as I want you to imagine, the possibilities that can happen to you. Instead of Aladdin, or calling out to Santa Claus, that's coming up pretty soon, you get to have a relationship with this one called Jesus, and it's not that he's going to be, you know, 
rub Jesus' sneaker and all of a sudden you're going to get three wishes. That's not how it works. But over time, as you develop a relationship with him, I can attest. That means I can tell you from my experience that good things do in fact happen to those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose, who have asked him to set out a plan and purpose for your life as I did back in December of 2007, as most of you know. So here's the spine beggar, and he's shouting it out. And I have to say that, um, that when he shouted that out, uh, things began to happen around him. First of all, the old devil pops up. He always does. When you try to seek out Jesus, just like that blind man did, here's what happens. Satan gets to influence those people standing around that blind beggar. And they said in Luke 18, 39, um, it says, those who led the way rebuked him. They shouted at him and said, you shut up. Don't you go seeking after Jesus. You're nothing. You're a low life. You're a blind beggar. Look at you. You're down on the ground sitting there because you have no function. You're a low life in earth. Leave. Don't get up. Don't shout out. Don't do anything. Don't get excited. Don't call upon Jesus. Satan's telling you exactly the same thing. Maybe even right now in your soul. Don't listen to John Tyler. Don't listen to anything coming out of the Word. Uh, you know why? Because Satan hated that beggar. He didn't want him to go and meet Jesus. He didn't want Jesus to do anything with him. Because the influence of Jesus, if Jesus does anything to or with that blind beggar, that blind beggar is going to go out and spread the news about Jesus, just like you will. Satan hates that. Because every soul that comes to Jesus is one that he doesn't get to join him in that lake of fire. You get it? He hates your guts. He hates my guts, but he can do nothing about it because I am protected because my big brother is in heaven. And he sends actually angels, according to God's word, to watch over and protect us, those who know and uh, who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So here we go. Um, listen to the next verse though, because Jesus tells his men to bring that blind beggar to me. Now, was that luck? Was it a coincidence that Jesus happened to be in Jericho that day? Was that a coincidence that the blind beggar was a little ways off? Was it a coincidence? Because remember, the crowds that were gathering around Jesus, they wanted to be healed too. So he was no different really than anybody else there. He was blind. Some in the crowd were blind. Blind. Some had leprosy. Some had broken whatever bones, and uh, they wanted to be healed. He wanted to be healed. So was it coincidence that out of all that crowd there, Jesus said to his men, his apostles, "Bring that blind beggar over here to me." It wasn't a coincidence. Jesus never wrote a story in his book, the Bible without having significance for you later on. Did you know that? He never wasted any words. He had significance for you today. You. You. you the one who is listening to me right now, expounding upon a story that Jesus himself was involved in. And here the, here's Satan telling the guy, be quiet, shut up. All of a sudden, when he yelled it out a few times, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Jesus finally told his men, bring that beggar over here. I want to uh, have something to ask him. So when the beggar approached Jesus, came right up to him, being carried, of course, by uh, Jesus' apostles, Jesus asked him a question. Now, you know what the blind man wanted. I know. I mean, I read the story. I know what he wanted. Jesus knew what he wanted, but he asked him a very peculiar question, peculiar question in verse 42. Cheers, Gloria. Cheers, Janice. Cheers, all of you who faithfully come here and listen for whatever reason. I don't know, but I'm glad that you do. Cheers. Um, verse 42, Jesus said to him the same thing he says to you today. 
Uh, what do you want me to do for you? See, this is how I started this, sitting here in Aladdin's cave. What is the most important thing in your life? For that man, it was to be healed of his blindness. So, Jesus, the great physician, uh, the one who owns everything, Deuteronomy 8.18, he says, uh, remember, the, remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives you the power to get wealth. So if you have financial difficulties, Jesus is the source. You have to come to him. You have to acknowledge that he is the Lord, that he is the Savior of the world, that he came to die for the sins of mankind. He paid the price, a horrible price on that cross of suffering and sin uh, and shame and took your sins upon himself in exchange for his righteousness so that you could go talk to God the Father directly without any means of a priest, a rabbi, or anybody else. This is why he came. Anyway, what do you want me to do for you, he asks. Why? He wants you, and he wanted the beggar to say with your tongue and moving your lips, this is what I need, Lord. That's asking him for something. You getting it now? It's not, dear Santa, I want this and give me a skateboard and roller skates too. This is Jesus, the one who actually can do things for you. All things uh, work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So Jesus asks you the same thing today. What do you want out of me? And uh, that's where we come to the title again. Imagine the possibilities that lie before you if you actually Take me up on this, click on that link, get to know the Lord, develop a relationship, then watch him go to work in your life as he is doing in mine. And it's fabulous. So, <clears throat> do you think that Jesus had no idea when he asked that question of the blind beggar, uh, what he wanted? Of course not. And he knows exactly what you want and he knows exactly what you need. And he's ready, willing, and able to provide that. He just wants a relationship with you. Now, imagine the possibilities because that blind man couldn't see a thing. And we're like him in this respect. We are spiritually blind. We don't get into this book, generally speaking, so we have no idea what God has lined up for us. We have no, I do. I get in here and study this thing daily. I study it. I, I talk about things that are in there. I know what God's promises are. So it's real easy to know that he's going to deliver on his promises. I don't have to rub the magic lamp. I don't have to have a genie come out. I know, now I'm not saying, Lord, I'd like to have a brand new Mercedes again, and I, you know, could you just put one out in the yard? Um, he says that he will, if you ask anything according to his will, then you shall have it. Now, you have to know what God's will is. So. Jesus told us, I think it's John 6, 39 and 40, if you want to follow me, follow it uh, up with me. And he says, and this is the will of the Father, and he explains what the will of the Father is. And it really is that all should come to repentance and be saved. That's God's will. That's his first thing. That's why he said in Matthew 6, 33, seek you out first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Go find my son. Welcome him into your life. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Then we can start this relationship. Then good things will happen to those who will love the Lord and call according to his purpose. So we're like that blind man in that we see, we don't see at all spiritual things. We see things that are physical in front of us. If it's in front of us, we believe it. If it's in the spiritual realm, it's difficult for us to believe that God can actually do what He says in His Word that He will do, which is magnificent things. And at the end of this little uh, sermonette, whatever you want to call it, uh, message, I'm going to tell you that, uh, well, I'll tell you now. I really, God isn't done with John Tyler yet. Every time He blesses me, I share it with you. It's not to go say, hey, look at me, how great I am, and I found favor with God. It's to show that he actually does honor the promises that he put in this book. And there's some big ones coming. And as soon as those happen, I'm going to be right back here 
uh, to share it with you, and I don't know what the background will be behind me at that point, but you will know something is in the wind when that happens. So the blind man couldn't see a thing, just like us. He had to have people carry him to the John. Base as that sounds, it's a fact. He had to have, he was so dependent on those around him to cook his food, to even show him where the food was. And you know, after a while, blind people, I mean, even at night, I can get up and walk through my house all the way to the John by myself because I, I've done it so many times, I can pretty much know where my chairs are and things that I would normally bump into, I won't. Uh, you get used to that stuff. So up to a point, a blind person can function, but Jesus was about to open up all kinds of possibilities for this guy. And this, that's what was first and foremost in his mind. If I could only see, wow, I wouldn't have to be dependent on all these people around me. And I could see who they are and see how nice they've been to me and thank them and look them in the eye. I can go to church, which in his case was the temple, where I've heard the words coming out of the door because they wouldn't let me in the place because I'm nothing but a blind beggar. But now I can go in there and actually see the person delivering the message. I can hear it like I always did, but I can see who it is. And he's thinking of all the possibilities that will lie uh, laid before him. So he said to the Lord, of course, Lord, I want to see. Jesus knew it, but again, he wanted him to confess that and uh, call out to him. Now, Jesus noticed one other thing. When the man said, Lord, I want to see. Um, that's in Luke 18. Lord. So he acknowledged that this was, in fact, the Lord. He acknowledged that this was the Messiah spoken of. So all of that faith that he had that this Jesus could do what he says he would do, and he's heard about how magnificent healings were in the past, he wanted to take this opportunity. Again, was that a coincidence that Jesus was there in Jericho? No. Was it a coincidence that the man happened to be right there down the street from him? No. Was it a coincidence that Jesus came by, right by him? No. Was it a coincidence that Jesus said to his men, bring that man out of all these other people to me? No. Was it good luck? See, no. Some people say, well, it was good luck, or I found the dollar bill in the convenience store, and I hit the lottery. Uh, that was lucky. Um, in their case, I guess it was good luck. But in your case, if you happen to trust the Lord as your Savior, then He's made the promises like good things happen to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. He will provide everything you need as He has done for me. I owe nobody anything. Sure, I have a mortgage. I don't have car payments. I don't have everything I buy, I pay for. And God gives me the ability to actually pay for it. I have a credit card in my wallet, don't use it. I mean, I use it every now and then and pay it right off immediately. But, to keep the credit thing going. But no, I, it, it, he provides absolutely everything that you will need. And then, there are bonuses that he gives you along the way. I told you about a couple a few weeks ago. Now, Jesus said to the blind man in Luke 18, Receive your sight. Boom, like poof. The man received his sight. Can you imagine? And he also said, by the way, your faith, because you call me Lord, son of David. Your faith has healed you. It not only has it healed your sight so that you can see, but now you can see spiritually, and you have earned yourself a place in heaven because you trusted me as Lord. So your faith in me has led me to deliver your sight to you. Imagine the possibilities now, this blind man. Imagine if you were blind all of your life, like this man, and all of a sudden he could see his friends. Everyone was blessed that day. Do you realize that? Not only did he receive his sight, but the person that had to go with him all the time, bring him to the john, didn't have to do it anymore. The one that had to go and prepare his meals and then sit him down at a table like this, uh, to have him eat his food, 
didn't have to do that anymore. So everyone was relieved of their duties that day that he could see it blessed everybody around him. That reminds me of Psalm chapter 40, which says when God delivers good things to his, then everybody gets to know about it, like I share it with you, and everybody gets to see what God has done, and they are blessed, and it turns them <coughs> to God. One more. We're almost done, too, by the way. So that man's life was changed dramatically that day that he could see. And all the possibilities that went through his head for years and years and years came to fruition that moment. The moment that he met Jesus. Same thing, I've been preaching this to you for a long time now. Same thing can happen to you. All you have to do is click on that link, meet Jesus, and then he'll take it from there with you as long as you don't jump ship. And, uh, you know, a lot of people do that. They'll go and pray, you know, well, that's my next paragraph. It says, yeah, John, but, you know, I prayed two or three times for something and it didn't happen. So, I'm done. That's not how a relationship works. Is that, well, I pointed this out once before too, I think. If you got married, you married that person for to develop that relationship. And because they disappoint you maybe, or you didn't get your way once in a while, does that mean you're out of there? No. Same thing with the Lord. It's a long-term relationship. And as time goes by, He opens up more the windows of heaven, as the Bible says. I, he says, prove me now herewith and see if I will not open the windows of heaven so that I might be able to bless you. I mean, he owns everything. He can give you anything that you need and anything that you need resources to go and tell others about him. He'll give you the money, the time, the talent, everything that you need to do it. So that's what you call praying in his will. Lord, I need money. For what? A new Mercedes? I'm not giving it to you. Um, so that I can go and uh, buy Bibles for somebody or put a, uh, some food in a food pantry and that type of stuff. Yeah, he'll take care of your daily bread needs so that you have extra. And then with the extra, he just wants to know, what are you going to do with it? You're going to be selfish and keep it for yourself? Again, the secrets are all found in this owner's manual for life. He says, if you give to me and my work, stingily, I will give to you stingily. But if you give bountifully to my work and to me, I'm going to pour it back onto you and give you even more. The story after story and parable after parable and they're proving this out. But you probably won't know that unless you get in there and read it. I know that because I've been in there and I've read them all and it's, a, it's great stuff. They're great promises and God always delivers on it. But let me continue. Yeah, but John, you know, I can't seem to muster up enough strength to, uh, to do what you're saying. I, I'm always depressed and down and, and uh, I just, you know, things are not too good for me and I'm just depressed. Well, let me tell you a quick story found in 1 Samuel 30, chapter 30, verse 1 through 8. It's a story about King David. You want to talk about some depression. Let me see if you've been this depressed. David and his men were out fighting battles with their enemies. And along came the Amalekites into his city of Ziklag, where David and his men lived. They captured all of his, the wives and the children, the daughters and the sons, everything, and took all their stuff and took them captive, captive to use them as slaves, and out of the city they go. David and his men come back to Ziklag, and they discover that Ziklag is now burning. Everything that they owned is on fire. Nobody's around. Their wives and their kids are all taken captive. And um, David, it says right here in verse 3, they found it destroyed. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. That's depressed, folks. Actually, I can tell you that I've been in that situation, and so have you. I think it was one time when my father died, it hit me so hard that you, you cry and you cry and you cry until you can't cry anymore. You can't muster up one more tear. Ever been there? Sure you have. Well, that's exactly how David and his men felt. Then after that, his men began to think, see the old devil slides some stuff in, 
to try to destroy the leader, David. He always does that. But if the men start saying, look, hey, David, it's your fault. If we weren't out with you doing battle, we would have been here to protect our wives and our family. It's your fault. And they actually decided and voted on picking up stones to stone David to death. Wouldn't that have been nice for the old devil to win? But, again, God has angels protecting you, and he did exactly that. So David did the smart thing. He, he was a prophet, too. He called the priest among them, and he said to him, um, I'm going to inquire uh, of the Lord and ask him this question. Lord, shall I pursue the raiding party, and will I overtake them? In other words, he had a need, like the blind man. This is what I need, Lord, but I need direction, because I don't want to go and kill all my guys and myself too. But I want to know, should I pursue that raiding party, and shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered and said, you will certainly overtake them, and you will succeed in the rescue. Why? Because good things happen to them, those who love the Lord, like David did, and who are called according to his purpose. And God had a purpose for King David. As a prophet, as one who wrote the book of Psalms, he had a lot of things lined up for him as he does for me, and as he does for you if you just let him. So, whether it's spiritual blindness that you suffer from, or mounting bills, poor relationships, bad health, it doesn't make any depression, makes no difference. Do the first thing, seek out the Lord, click on that link below, this is YouTube we're talking about, and then God will change your life dramatically as he did with the blind man. So, as I leave you this week, I want you to think about, imagine, look around, imagine the possibilities of when you get to develop and know this Messiah, this King of Kings, Lord of Lords, this one called Jesus. Click on that link, get to know him, develop that relationship, and then I can promise you the same thing he promised me based on the authority of his word, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the first thing he gives you as that gift is heaven. After that, I'm telling you, I'm testifying to it, he will take care of your every need, your daily bread needs, and beyond that, as I will point out from time to time, he pours out blessings that even you can't even fathom or believe. And again, he's working on two right now that I know of, and I will be reporting them back to you. So the first thing you have to do is seek him out. The second thing is ask God. The same thing I did in December of 2007. Lord, show me your plan and your purpose for my life, and then off you go. It's, it's amazing what uh, the possibilities are that lie before you. So that's it for this week, and I will see you guys next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, as they say. See you later.